Bat and the Waiting Game. Chapter 9. Bowls. Bat had never eaten a bowl of cereal without milk before, but Israel poured half the box into a gray and pink bowl and then poured a bunch of pistachios into a slightly smaller green bowl with swirly blue curlicues all over it. Then he put away the cereal box and the bag of pistachios, told Bat, grab the chocolate bar and head it out into the backyard. Bat, chocolate bar in hand, followed him. Wow, he said, standing in the doorway, looking into the yard. Israel was placing the two fancy bowls full of snacks on a table underneath the big shade tree. But that was the least interesting thing happening in the yard. Bat counted 11 pinwheel wind spinners planted in the garden beds all around the yard. Some had bits of colored glass suspended in webs of metal. Others were all metal, but in a mix of copper and silver. Big, bright glass orbs were tucked everywhere, glints of shiny color under the tree, lining the path through the yard that ended in a garden shed. The shade tree's branches were heavy with stained glass ornaments and wind chimes that filled the air with silvery tinkles and deep vibrating clangs. There were so much to see and hear that Bat felt caught between it all. The colors, the sounds, the newness of everything. Suddenly, despite the beauty and excitement of Israel's amazing backyard, Bat wished desperately that he were home. Hey, Israel said, are you okay? Bat felt himself bouncing on the balls of his feet, and he knew his eyes were full of tears. He still clutched the chocolate bar in his hand. Sort of, not really, he said. Israel scratched his head. Come on, he said, taking the chocolate bar from Bat and setting it on the table. I'll introduce you to my mom. But instead of leading Bat into the house, Israel walked through the garden to the shed. As they crossed the yard, Bat took deep, calming breaths and wiped his eyes. The shed door was open, and as he got closer, Bat saw that it wasn't just a place to store sho shovels and rakes. Hey, Mom, Israel said. You're home, came a voice from inside the shed. Is your friend with you? Yep, said Israel. Bat, come say hi to my mom. Bat peered into the shed. Israel's mom was in there, surrounded by shelves of full of bowls and cups and plates and pots, some glazed in bright colors, others the flat gray of unfinished clay. She was sitting behind a potter's wheel, a lump of wet clay in her hands. Splatters of clay decorated her arms and her overalls. Hi, Bat, she said. I'm Cora. Hello, Bat said. What are you doing? I'm making a bowl, Cora said. Do you want to try? Bat shook his head. I don't like slimy things, he said, or sticky things. He looked around at all the shelves and all the things upon them. Did you make all this stuff? Most of it, Cora said. Over there is Israel's work. The shelf she pointed to was filled with lumps of clay that looked a lot like the lump of clay Israel had made for Bat, which Bat had right then tucked into his the pocket of his vest. Mom's stuff is better than mine, Israel said. She's a professional artist. I'm just starting out. Bat looked back and forth between the pottery. Cora had made and the awkward lumps Israel had made. Yes, he said. Your mom's stuff is way better. Israel crossed his arms and across his chest. Bat felt his stomach rumble and said, I think I'm ready for that snack now. Chapter 10. Missing Connections. Mom's perfectly average station wagon felt decidedly less than average that evening. So, when she, collected ba when she collected Bat from Israel's house. So, how was it? Mom asked, pulling the car in reverse to back down the driveway. Mom, Bat said, have you ever thought about getting a truck? A truck, Mom said. She shifted into drive and stepped on the gas. Yes, Bat, a big one. Actually, Mom said, the first car I bought when I was 18 years old was a truck. Really? Was it like Tom's truck? Tom, asked Mom, glancing over at Bat. Israel's dad, Bat said. Ah, I didn't realize you were on a first name basis. It's not a big deal, Bat said. Tom is cool. Mom laughed. 
Careful, or you might make me jealous. You've never called me cool. Anyway, she said, did you have a good time with Israel? Mm-hmm, said Bat. Then he realized that he hadn't yet asked about Thor. Oh, he said, is Thor okay? Did you remember to give him his four o'clock feeding? Of course I did, Mom said. She flicked on her turn signal and made a right in onto their street, Plum Lane. Thor is great. He's in the back. You put Thor in the trunk? Bat's voice went high and squeaky with indignation. He's fine, Mom said as she pulled into their driveway, put the car in park, and turned the key. Bat unlatched his seatbelt, threw open his door, and ran around to the back of the car. He clicked open the rear door and pushed it up. Ooh, he said. There was Thor's travel carrier, a second-hand cat carrier, but there was something else back there, too. A plastic gate or fence or something. It's a doggy pen, Mom said. Someone donated it to the clinic today, and I thought we could use it for Thor. What do you think? Want to help me set it up? This pen, Bat thought, was even cooler than Tom's truck. They got the sections of the pen, four plastic sides, it turned out, to form a square into the house. Mom tried to set the two pieces she was carrying down in the living room, but Bat carried his two sections all the way down the hallway and into his bedroom, where he intended to build it. Then he immediately started trying to figure out how to connect them together. We can do it later, Bat, Mom said, standing in the doorway of his room. After dinner and bath time. I want to do it now, Bat said, all his concentration on hooking the two pieces together. He could see, though, that something was missing. Two plastic panels just wouldn't latch together. Are there more parts? he asked. I don't think so, Mom said. And she came into Bat's room to see what the problem was. Oh, there must be connecting rods that slip into the edges here to hold the sections together. I don't know, Bat. Maybe they're at the clinic and I just didn't see them. We have to go back to the clinic and find them, Bat said. Not tonight, honey. It's getting late. We're all done being out in the world for today. We have to build the pen for Thor. Bat felt the anxious knot tightening in his chest the way it sometimes did. He knew he should walk away from the problem and take deep, calming breaths. But he didn't want to walk away from the problem and take deep, calming breaths. He wanted to fix the problem. Bat, said Mom, you've had a long day, haven't you? She knelt down beside him and took his hands into hers. She squeezed his hands and released, her signal to him that she was going to try to help him calm down. If he didn't want to help, Bat knew he could take a step away, but he still stayed. His mom moved her hands to her wrists and squeezed and released. And then she worked her way up his arms, squeezing his forearms and his elbows and his biceps and his shoulders, then working her way back down. Baby, she said, and it was the word that pushed Bat over the edge. He wasn't a baby. He wasn't anywhere close to being a baby. Thor was a baby, and Bat was his caretaker, and right now he wanted to take care of Thor by building his playpen. And if that meant going back to the clinic, even though it was closed for the day, then that is what they should do. And Bat didn't understand why Mom couldn't see how important this was and how right he was and to do just do what he wanted her to do. Bat, honey, shh. Mom said, and that's when Bat heard the sound he was making. He hadn't even noticed that he started making the sound, the high-pitched whine that seemed to come out of him when he was the most upset, when he had reached the end of his rope, as Mom called it. But even then, he hated making the noise. It felt so good, too, just as it felt good to bounce on the soles of his feet. Mom's hands were still squeezing Bat's arms. And then she put her arms around him, pulling him close, and she held him just like that in a nice, tight hug. And Bat wanted the same, at the same time to pull away from her and never be let go. She held him until he stopped needing to make high-pitched whining sounds, until he stopped needing to bounce on the soles of his feet, until a knot in his chest began to relax and unwind. And then she said very softly, 
Come on, Bat, let me run a bath for you. And Bat let her lead the way away from the pen.